started. Today is Tuesday, June 29th, uh, 2021. Uh, this is our last lecture for part two. After this, we are crazily halfway through the material we are going to be responsible for. Uh, we just have a little bit to finish up today. We have to finish our discussion of joints, finish our discussion of synovial joints, talk about the movements that joints allow. Uh, this is going to be important information, obviously, for this exam, but also this is going to be the stuff we're going to use moving forward into the next section. This, the, the skeletal system and the muscle system really go hand in hand. Many of the bone features we've talked about uh, that you're learning, you're going to need to not just know for this test, but you're going to need to know them for the muscle attachment points of the next test. And all these movements that these joints allow, uh, we're going to be using as the actions for the muscles in the next section as well. So these two kind of go hand in hand really, really well that way. Uh, remember, uh, we have adjusted the due date for your 30-point skeletal review. Uh, again, if you've been struggling, I want you to be able to use the information we talk about today uh, to be able to do that, but it has to be due at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Again, because I want to be able to post the key so people can learn from this and have time to prepare for Thursday's exam, because obviously anything that you're putting this much time and effort into that's worth 30 points, that's graded for correctness, is something that will easily be represented on both the lab and the lecture exam. So it is important to make sure you know this information. And since I won't have it graded by the time you take the exam, I want to make sure the key posts. So the key is going to post at eight. It's due at eight. Make sure you turn it in. If you've got it done, turn it in now. A couple of people have already done that. So don't forget. Uh, there will be no forgiveness on this. So make sure you turn it in on time. You've had plenty of warnings for that. Uh, we have the rest of our group presentations today, and even with all of that, uh, we should still have an opportunity for a question answer review. I remember like last time, a review is not me standing up here telling you what I think is important. That is what I do every day in class. So that is your opportunity to ask questions about stuff you're not clear about, and we'll try to make it clear so you can be successful on the exam. Uh, you have one day off. This is your big weekend to study uh, for the exam. Thursday, we have the lab and lecture exam. You know exactly what to expect from that. Uh, and then on Friday, even though it is 4th of July weekend, it is not the holiday yet. We are starting uh, on uh, Friday with the muscular system. And that lecture is going to have a tremendous amount. We're going to do almost all of the anatomy that is gonna be vital for our understanding of the function of the muscular system. So it is a very, very important lecture to make sure you are a part of. Uh, so make sure you're there for that. Then you get a nice three day weekend uh, with Monday being a holiday. Uh, however, I don't want you to totally forget about uh, studying during that time. So also uh, on Tuesday, when we come back, your first labster uh, for the muscular system is gonna be due and that is on muscle tissue. And that is the game plan. All right, like I said, this takes us to our halfway point. Uh, we are rapidly approaching the end. It's crazy uh, how insanely fast summer goes. Again, welcome to summer school. I told you not to take this. All right, questions on any of that? Negative. All right, then let's dive into the material. We left off in the last class and uh, we had been talking about uh, the three ways you're gonna be responsible for joints. Uh, on the exam, I will point to a joint and I will ask one of three questions. I will ask you for the functional classification of which there are three possible correct answers, a synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, diarthrosis. I could point at a joint and I could ask you for the structural classification of which there are four right answers, synostosis, fibrosis, cartilaginous, and synovial. And I could also ask you to identify the specific type of joint. And how many specific types were there that we were responsible for for the fibrous joints? Three. Three, excellent. All right, what were they again? Suture, syndesmosis, and um, my favorite, gumphosis. There you go. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. How many specific types were there for uh, the cartilaginous? Two. Two. Excellent. What were they? Sichondrosis and synthesis. Excellent. 
And then lastly, synovial joints, which we haven't talked about yet, but we did at least mention how many specific types there were. How many specific types are there for the synovial joints? Six. Six, excellent. So notice, again, being the smart, sophisticated students that you are, if I point to a joint and ask you for a functional classification, there are only three possible right answers. If I point at a joint and ask you for a structural classification, there are only four right answers. And if I point at a joint and ask for the specific type, there's only 11 possible right answers. So again, be smart and sophisticated. Pay attention to the words that I use on the questions. I'm very precise and specific in my wording. Make sure you're equally specific and precise in your answers. Now, we, like I said, we've talked about all of these with the exception of synovial joints. So let's talk about our synovial joints. Uh, we know two very important things about synovial joints. As we mentioned, there are six specific types. And we also know that all six of these specific types, all synovial joints are, uh, what functional classification? Uh, Diarthritic, di diarthritis. Right, they're diarthritic if we wanted to use the adjective, uh, or we could say diarthroses, right? If we wanted to make them nouns and plural, excellent. So we have all of that as well. And when you think of the free moving joints, there is a lot of variation in them. Uh, whether it is the joints of my fingers, whether it is my shoulder, uh, whether it is uh, my elbow, there's all sorts of different types. Uh, it is by far the most diverse, having six specific types, but all synovial joints must have these four, oops, let me say, type this here. All synovial joints must have these four characteristics. The largest synovial joint is probably your hip. The smallest, remember those tiny little auditory articles we learned about inside of our temporal bone? The incus, the stapes, and the malus? Uh, those have synovial joints as well. Remember all three of them would fit on the, on the tip of my finger, right? So those are synovial joints and so is my hip. And so they're dramatically, dramatically different, but all of those and all the ones in between all have these four main characteristics. We've got this really simple illustration right here, but let's cheat and draw it because I find that sometimes useful to help us to understand these things. Obviously we have two bones, so let's go ahead and draw those. Oops, no, I don't like blue. So bone one, and bone two, and just for argument's sakes, we'll make one convex and one concave. The shape doesn't matter so much. The first characteristic that all synovial joints have is all synovial joints, where they articulate, have hyaline cartilage along their surfaces. Of course, this isn't the only place we find hyaline cartilage in the body. This one, where it forms a joint at the end of, for instance, a long bone, as we've talked about, we call articular cartilage. Oops, don't need this to be capitalized. So this articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage. And what is its function? Uh, reduce friction between the two bones. Yeah, provides a cushion and reduces friction, helps to protect the bone, helps to reduce the wear and tear. So this is a very important, um, uh, uh, important uh, protective structure of this. The second thing that all synovial joints, as the name indicates, must have uh, is some kind of synovial membrane, right? We talked about a need in a synovial membrane. It's going to produce synovial fluid. So we need a place to keep that. Uh, so what it's going to have is a structure we call an articular capsule. 
Articular, of course, just refers to the joint. And this capsule basically just means that it is an enclosed space. Now, this articular capsule is going to have two specific components to it. The first is a fibrous outer layer that surrounds the joint and contains the joint inside of it. And this fibrous capsule, this fibrous layer of the capsule uh, has some structure, has some integrity, helps to protect and contain this joint. But lining the inner surface of this is where we have our synovial membrane. So lining the inner surface, whoops, I guess we didn't know. Let's go there. Underneath this and that. Lining the inner surface of this articular capsule is our synovial membrane. Luckily, we learned about synovial membranes. We know like all membranes, it is made of an epithelial tissue sitting on top of a connective tissue. But remember, we learned that the synovial membrane was very special. It is just a scant epithelium where it's just small clusters of cells. So just that scant layer. And remember, even the connective tissue is our good friend areolar, which we find everywhere, but with a lot more matrix, with a lot more fibers inside of it. And of course, what is the function of an articular, uh, pardon me, of a synovial membrane? I'll provide a cavity for lubrication. Well, so you've got the right idea. The articular capsule absolutely forms that uh, joint cavity. And that joint cavity again surrounds it. But you are correct. This is a space. And what does this space contain? Synovial fluid. fluids. Yeah. Remember, the synovial membrane produces synovial fluid. And unlike a serous membrane where it's just a thin layer, here we want to both fill the cavity. And not only do we fill the cavity, but this synovial membrane is constantly producing new synovial fluid and reabsorbing old. Now, what is the function of the synovial fluid? Friction. Okay. Reduce friction. Again, cushion the bones. However, if we felt filled this joint cavity with adipose tissue, wouldn't that do the exact same thing? Wouldn't that cushion the bones? Wouldn't that reduce the friction between the bones if we filled this with adipose? I'll give you a hint, the answer is yes. So why don't we do that? Why are we constantly making and reabsorbing? Why are we constantly cycling the synovial fluid within this joint? There must be a third function for the synovial fluid. And what might that be? Some kind of nutrients. Exactly. And more specifically, it provides nutrients and removes waste for the hyaline cartilage. Remember, our hyaline cartilage is avascular. Yes, it's going to be able to get some of the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs from the blood vessels in the bone but this articular cartilage is very vascular. I mean, it's very thick. So it's not gonna be able to diffuse all the way through it. So by constantly producing synovial fluid and spreading it across here and then reabsorbing it again, by cycling and circulating this synovial fluid, 
we're able to bathe this highland cartilage with nutrients. We are able to uh, remove waste, give it the oxygen that it needs and help maintain the health of the highland cartilage. And so these four things, the articular cartilage on the end of the bones, the joint cavity, which is the space that is formed by the articular capsule that wraps around it, that has a fibrous layer to maintain the integrity of that joint, and the synovial membrane that produces our synovial fluid. Whether it's the tiny bones in our ear, or your knee, or your hip, or your shoulder, or any joint in between, they all have these four components. And again, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but I know you're aware of these kind of things because as we know, and I think we talked about this last time, I don't remember, but we'll talk about it again. If for instance, our synovial membrane, our joint cavity becomes irritated, becomes damaged or injured, it will start to produce an increased amount of synovial fluid. And what happens when the amount of synovial fluid being produced increases in this joint? Causes inflammation. Yeah, we get inflammation. It swells, it becomes painful. We lose range of motion. So what do you need to do when that is the case? Rest. Rest. Yeah, you need to rest it. You need to stop moving it. You need to let it repair itself let the irritation go away, maybe take some anti-inflammatories, but mostly rest and stop moving it and it will repair itself. However, here's the problem. You're a first string quarterback on your fantasy football team, right? Do you want him taking the day off and resting it, right? He's got to make sure he gets his 30 touchdowns to reach his incentives in his contract. So what does that quarterback do? Does he sit on the sidelines and rest for the day? No, what do they do? Wrap it up and give them a shot. Yeah, well, okay, one thing that they'll do is give them a shot, absolutely, and that shot can help to decrease the inflammation in that area. But the other thing they'll do is they'll take a really large bore needle. And with that really large bore needle, they'll insert it into the joint cavity and suck out some of that fluid. Removing the irritation, removing the fluid, allowing that free range of motion again. Right. Of course, that hasn't helped to heal the injury that was already in there. And if you think about it, putting a, a needle through the joint cavity just damages and irritates the, uh, the synovial membrane even more, meaning that it's going to produce even more synovial fluid and swell even more as a result of that. But that'll be three hours from now and the football game will be over at that point. And all that matters is that you win. Right. This is where you enthusiastically say hoo ya. All right, excellent. So again, we've all heard of cases of that, people having their joints drained, uh, things along those lines. Like you said, take an anti-inflammatory shots to bring it down. None of that fixes it, but if we reduce the swelling, we regain range of motion. And that's what they're trying to do in those short-term situations. All right, so as we said, these are the four things that every single synovial joint must have must have that articular cartilage on the ends of the bones, must have that articular capsule on the outer surface. And notice again, uh, we can clearly see that it has two layers, that fibrous outer layer and that inner synovial membrane. That capsule forms the joint cavity, a space around the articulations of the bones that the synovial membrane fills with synovial fluid and constantly cycles it around. So if we define a synovial joint, all synovial joints of the body must have these four things, period. However, many synovial joints have additional structures that help in their function. These additional structures are not required
to be considered a synovial joint, but uh, let's say it this way. Most joints have one or more of these additional structures. So not required, let's bing. And I don't think this has to be quite that big. So these are not required for a synovial joint, but most synovial joints will have one or more of these accessory structures. Let's see some examples of this here. For instance, we see the example of the shoulder. Often joints will have additional ligaments and tendons that help to stabilize them and hold them in place. And someone again, remind me of what the difference between a ligament and a tendon is. What's a ligament do? Next bone to bone. Excellent. Yeah, versus a tendon. Muscle to bone. Excellent. Let's go back to our pretty picture. So again, what we can have are additional ligaments, for instance, attaching bone to bone. One of the interesting things about these ligaments is they can actually be outside and most are outside the joint cavity, but some can actually be located inside the joint cavity. Or as we talked about, if we had some nice big muscle up here, it's tendon. Uh, what could come and connect to the bone and would help to stabilize that joint and hold it into place. So again, ligaments, bone to bone, tendons, muscle to bone. Uh, most of these are outside the joint cavity, but sometimes they can be inside the joint cavity. And we actually see a little of this here in the shoulder. Notice here, we actually see uh, the long head of the bicep brachia and notice its tendon actually goes into the joint cavity and connects to that roughened bump above the glenoid fossa on the scapula. And what did we say that attachment point, that origin of the long head of the bicep brachia was? What is that roughened attachment point above the glenoid cavity? Supraglenoid process. Close, supraglenoid tubercle, tubercle. A tubercle is basically a small rough muscle attachment point. That's what tubercle means. So again, as I mentioned, those definitions can sometimes be useful. Excellent. Uh, another thing that can help to support this are extensions of the joint cavity, right? So let's again, go back to our simple illustration here. What can actually happen in some instances, and I'll cheat by doing that. Our joint cavity is actually sometimes able to expand out. And again, of course, not only does the fibrous cavity extend out, but also the synovial membrane that is within it extends out as well and basically forms this fluid filled cushion. And this fluid filled cushion is what is known as a bursa or sometimes referred to as a bursa sac. Now, remember the same way we said that the synovial membrane inside the joint cavity can become irritated and cause inflammation. Well, notice we have the same thing here as well. Here we have that bursa and that bursa is fluid filled and it is lined with a synovial membrane. So if this synovial membrane gets irritated, we can get a swelling of fluid within this bursa. And of course, what do we call that condition? Bursitis. Bursitis, absolutely. Bursitis is the inflammation of the bursa. This particular bursa, notice is located between the joint of the uh, shoulder and the acromion, so that when the uh, neck and head of the humerus comes up, it's not whacking against the bone of the acromion. However, if you get bursitis 
in the subacromial bursa, it will actually start to push down on your arm within the joint cavity and it will also limit your range of motion. Now, sometimes these extensions of the uh, synovial membrane, these extensions of the joint cavity uh, or, or the articular capsule really uh, are small pillow-like structures, but sometimes they elongate. And when they elongate, they form these structures called tendon sheaths. Notice in this case that tendon of the long head of the bicep brachia is surrounded by this tube-like extension of the bursa, which is how it's able to get into the joint cavity. But this probably isn't the most famous tendon sheath. Here in your wrist region, you happen to have a tendon sheath that wraps around many of the tendons that go to your hand and fingers which is awesome, it stabilizes them so that when you flex your hand, all your tendons don't stick out as a result of that. However, the problem with that is if you happen to do a lot of repetitive motions with your hands and fingers, those tendons can become inflamed and irritated. And because they're surrounded in a tendon sheath that travels right through the carpal region of your hand, uh, as those tendons become inflamed, they can constrict the nerves and constrict the blood vessels that are going to the hand as well, leading to weakness of the hand, tingling sensation, pain, numbing. And what do we call that condition? Carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel syndrome, syndrome. right? Because the structure that is here is that carpal tunnel. So that carpal tunnel is that tendon sheath that the tendons go through. And if the tendons inside it inflame, uh, that can become an issue. For some individuals that have chronic carpal tunnel, one of the things that they will do, it's a relatively extreme situation, so it isn't typically the first thing they do to try to resolve it. But in some cases, what they will do is actually go in and cut that tendon sheath. By cutting that tendon sheath and opening up the space, it allows the blood and nerves to reach there without being irritated and damaged, and sometimes can alleviate those problems. Excellent. So like I said, that's one that many people are familiar with, or I know somebody who's had to deal with, and that is an example of one of those tendon sheath, those extensions of the uh, uh, articular capsule. Let's take a look at a different joint. This one happens to be the knee. There are many specialized joints in the body. Uh, I am only gonna hold you responsible for the specific anatomy of one of those, and that will be the knee. Uh, we will, after our group presentations, because we haven't talked about the bone and bone features associated with the knee yet, we'll put them together to form a knee and we'll talk about all of the accessory structures. But one of the accessory structures you may already be familiar with are these uh, big thick chunks of fibrocartilage that are found within the joint cavity. Notice this is not the articular cartilage. We still have the hyaline cartilage that is on the surface of the bones. But in between the two bones is a big thick a chunk of fibrocartilage, which we know reduces cushion, uh, provides that uh, shock absorption, and it helps to stabilize the femur in the tibia, helping to form the functional joint that is the knee. This big chunk of fibrocartilage is what is known uh, singularly as the meniscus, although you have two menisci, a medial and a lateral one. So you have these two, one's really C-shaped and the other circular. Uh, that help to stabilize the head of the femur, reduce that cushion, provide that shock absorption. Uh, and so it's a place uh, where, another place where you find fibrocartilage in the body. And so that is an articular disc. Not surprisingly, we see that in the knee. We didn't see that in the elbow because again, the legs are weight bearing. So that's one of the big differences we see. Cushioning can come not just from fibrocartilage, but also from chunks of adipose, what is known as a fat pad. Uh, again, a classic example is this fat pad located here inferior to the patella, so that as you're flexing and extending your knee, uh, your patella isn't banging against the uh, head of the tibia 
causing damage. So it helps to cushion it and hold it in place loosely. So again, if your leg is relaxed, you're able to reach down and you can uh, mildly uh, 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 move your patella uh, within that space. Again, don't displace it or anything like that. Don't be vigorously, but there's some looseness to that because of that fat pad underneath. All right, questions on those. So like I said, none of these are required to make a synovial joint, but most synovial joints will have one or more of these accessory structures to help to stabilize them and hold them in place. In fact, as I mentioned, when we get to the knee, we will learn with the knee that there is one tendon. There are five ligaments. Uh, there are, well, that will be more than that, but this is what you'll be responsible for. You'll be responsible for one tendon, five ligaments, uh, and uh, I think that's it. All the others are bone and bone features, I think, that you're already responsible for. So we'll, and we'll obviously put all the bone features together as well that are on your list. So we will talk about the anatomy of the knee, but we haven't discussed it yet. As you can see, there's far more than that involved in stabilizing the knee. The knee is definitely one of the more complex uh, 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 joints in the body, but we'll talk about uh, some of the major structures that help to stabilize it and hold it in place. But like I said, we'll save that for after the group presentations. Someone needs to remind me, because once we get done with the group presentation, we're all going to do a big sigh and we're going to be done and be excited to be done, but uh, we're not really done. So someone help me remember if I forget. I'll write it down, but I will forget. All right. Questions on what it takes to make a synovial joint. All right, so what we need to talk about now, now that we're comfortable with how to make a synovial joint, we have to talk about the six specific types of synovial joints. Notice with these six specific types, uh, there are two keys to them. Uh, the first is going to be the shape of the bones that articulate. That is how we determine the six types. But also remember the other big difference. These are all diarthritic. But they allow different movements along different axes. How do you spell axes? Axes? That doesn't look right. That's axes. A X C S. Yeah. Is that is axes? C. E. Uh, no C. Yes. Oh. What C? S I, like Spanish. Yes. Just write axes. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that was the answer. The answer to your question was yes. The A X E S. A X E S. Really? Uh, yeah. I don't like it. I don't like it. Anatomists hate you. It's all good. There you go. <laughs> Axes. There we go. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Eve. Uh, uh, uh. All right, this is a stupid story. Uh, as you know, I got my uh, I got my uh, degree in uh, my PhD in neuroscience. And uh, one year when I was in graduate school, I got to go to Cold Spring Harbor in New York uh, for a seminar. And one of the people who talked there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Hubel. Uh, and uh, David Hubel is a famous neuroscientist that I know none of you guys know. He won the Nobel Prize, a tremendous uh, um, researcher studied the, the development of the visual system in cats. And like I said, Hubel and Weasel got the uh, Nobel Prize for their research. And he was there talking. And at one point uh, during his discussion, he said that uh, they're just, because we were talking about how the field has advanced since he was there. And one of the things that he said is, there's some things that I will refuse to believe even if they're shown to be true. 
And I just thought that that was such an incredibly cocky thing and amazing thing for an individual to say. But when you've won the Nobel Prize, you can get away with something like that. And so, and so I feel like that. I don't care how it spells here. I don't care how it's right. That's how I'm going to spell it because axes, E-X, that's how you spell axes. All right, excellent. Totally random thought. I just like, popped in my head. Sorry. Anyway, the point is... <laughs> Different shapes allow different motions. All of these, remember, are going to allow a free range of motions, but not all on the same axis. So we have to look at the different types of axes uh, that these are going to allow, the different shapes. And for every single one of them, we must know at least one or two examples. Obviously, how many joints are there in the body? Hundreds. Exactly, there are a lot. So I'm not just gonna randomly pull some joint at the body, point at it and say, what kind of joint is this? You're not gonna have to memorize every single joint in the body of what type it is. But for every single of our specific types of synovial joints, I will give you at least one or two examples. And so you should know those one or two examples. All right, so again, most of them are pretty obvious. And so let's do that. So those are the three things we need to know. We need to figure out the shapes of the bones, the type of movement they allow, and a couple examples. Now, when we're talking about these movements, there are, again, as we've talked about, vocabulary is very, very important. And again, one of the reasons we're emphasizing this so much is not only does this help us to understand the joints and what the joints allow, but as I also mentioned, these are going to be the actions of the muscles. So when, for instance, we are talking about the sartorius muscle in the next section, and I tell you that the sartorius muscle flexes the knee, flexes the hip, uh, abducts the hip, and laterally rotates the hip, that means something to you because you're gonna to need to know and understand those. So when we talk about motions, the easiest way to understand this as they kind of explained it in your textbook is to think about the relationship between two objects. And the two objects, normally I grab my big yardstick and I put it on my desk when we're talking about this. And we talk about the relationship of these two structures. So we have uh, the pad of paper, we have our pen, and they have a relationship to each other. Now, the first and easiest type of motion is basically the gliding, the moving of the pen back and forth along the surface. Notice it can go forward and back and left and right and all in between. But notice the relationship between the pen and the paper doesn't change when I do that. I'm not changing the angle. That type of motion is what we call a non-axial linear motion or a gliding motion. Another way to demonstrate this is when you put your two hands together. You put your hands together and you can rub them up and down and left and right and all around and back and forth, but you're not changing the angle. You're not changing the relationship of them. So that is an example of a non-axial or a gliding motion. However, the other thing we can do with the pen is leave the pen anchored to one location and we could move it left and right. As I moved it left and right, that would be an angular motion because we're changing the angle between the pen and the paper. But notice by only going left and right, I'm just changing it on one axis. So that would be a uniaxial motion. We've talked about an example of this with the joint between my phalanges, right? I have a free range of motion on that one axis. However, if I talk about the joint between the proximal phalanx and the second metacarpal, Remember, we talked about that one. I can go forward and back, but I also can go left and right. So that would be biaxial motion, two axes of motion. And of course, something like my shoulder can go up and down, can go forward and back, and can go all sorts of angles in between. That would be a multi-axial motion. 
So all of those change the angle between the two bones, but it's whether it's on one plane, two planes, or many planes. So these are all angular motions that can either be uniaxial, biaxial, or multiaxial. However, there's one more way we can change the relationship of my pen to the paper. And that's if I spin the pen along its longitudinal axis. Notice in this case, the angle doesn't change, right? Obviously, if I spun it this way, I would be rotating it, but that would be an angular change. But in this case, this is a non-angular rotation, a non-axial rotation where I'm just rotating it around. And that type of motion is what we call, oops, we'll get back to circumduction in a second, is what we call a rotation. Again, we like to use examples of the body. My head, I'm gonna shake my head no, is something that I rotate. All right, I can rotate my vertebral column by spinning my vertebral column as well. When it's on the midline, we just call it a rotation. But another thing I can rotate is I can actually rotate my humerus. This one's a little trickier to understand. So if you take your elbow and bend your elbow, when you bend your elbow and have your hand on your stomach, notice that as I move my hand this way, my humerus hasn't changed its angle. It hasn't changed its position, but notice my humerus is rotating. So as I go back and forth like this, my humerus is rotating like the pen. Now notice this is not on the midline. So when we have a rotation that's not on the midline, we identify it by what the front of the bone is doing. Notice in this case, the front of the bone is moving away from the midline. And so we would call that a lateral rotation. When I come this way, the humerus is rotating, the front of the humerus is rotating for, towards the midline and we would call that a medial rotation. So lateral rotation, medial rotation. But if I just do it on the midline, that's just a rotation. Now notice we skipped something here. If we have a joint, actually let's use my finger. If we have a joint that has at least biaxial motion, up and down and left and right. And I do them sequ sequentially, up, right, down, left. Notice as I'm making this type of a motion, the tip of my finger, well, the tip of my finger is making a circle, whereas the base of my finger stays in the same location. Notice like the illustration, I'm basically making a cone-shaped motion. And this cone-shaped motion has a special term. It is called circumduction. So any joint that is biaxial or multiaxial right, like my arm, I can make that circumduction. So a circumduction requires bi or multi-axial motion and rotation, again, is along the longitudinal axis. Uh, rolling your neck, would that be the same as well? Uh, great question, no. So rolling your neck is not considered a circumduction because circumduction specifically has to be a flexion, extension, adduction, and abduction, uh, which are terms we haven't talked about yet, but we're gonna get to in a second. Um, whereas that is just a flex, lateral flex, extend, lateral flex. So yeah, no, technically it would be the same kind of motion, but it wouldn't be a circumduction. That's a great point. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. Yes, but you are correct. It's a similar type motion, but we wouldn't call it circumduction. All right. And maybe Bob McCarty will come up with a uh, thesis and uh... maybe. All right, excellent. So let's go through these. Identify our six specific types of synovial joints and we'll move forward from that. All right, the first is a planar joint. With a planar joint, uh, basically the surfaces are two flat articulating surfaces. So we have one flat articulating surface facing against another flat articulating surface, like we talked about with our hands. 
and basically they just glide back and forth. So they allow that non-axial gliding movement back and forth. Notice to do this, we kind of have to have these block shaped bones and not surprisingly, the place we have our block shaped bones is in the carpals and the tarsals, our short bones. Now, be careful. When I'm talking about the planar joint, I'm not talking about what allows me to move my hand back and forth or left and right like that. That is a different joint we'll talk about in a second. But if I stabilize my wrist, notice I can still move my hand back and forth, right? That ability to move the hand back and forth are those carpal bones basically gliding across the surface of each other. Right. If you look down at your foot, your foot, you're able to move it up and down. But you also have the ability to twist your foot a little bit to the left and to the right. That ability to twist the foot a little bit to the left and to the right are the sliding of those tarsal bones of the foot back and forth. So that type of gliding motion is what allowed our planar movement of planar joints. And again, we find them in our short bones. That is where we find these planar joints. All right, questions on that one? Excellent. Let's look at our second one. Second is a hinge. The hinge is our most common specific type. Oops, not nice, but common, there you go. Most common specific type. With the hinge, as the illustration shows, we have one convex surface that sits in one concave surface. One of the classic examples, as you can see here, is that trochlea of the humerus sitting in the trochlear notch of the ulna. So we have one convex sitting in one concave. And this allows for uniaxial motion. Like for instance, in between the phalanges. And I have that uniaxial motion of the hinge, my elbow, my knee. I have the concave uh, convex surfaces of the femur sitting in the concave surface of the tibia, and that allows that one-way movement, right? Your knee shouldn't be kicking out to the side. If it is, see a doctor immediately. So all of these allow one-way movement, and there are a ton of examples. The elbow, the knee, the ankle, the joint between the phalanges, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said, this is by far the most common specific type. But what we can do with a hinge joint is elongate it. We're going to still have a concave surface but and a convex surface, but it's going to be elongated. We get an elongated convex. We get an elongated concave. And with that type of shape, we have what is known as an ellipsoidal or condyloid shape. The example notice that they've given us here is the one I've given you a couple times, the joint between the proximal phalanx and the metacarpal. But the other example I would like to give you is this one we were talking about yesterday as well. Remember, we talked about in the carpals, it is just the scaphoid and the lunate that basically form the joint with the styloid process of the radius and the styloid process of the ulna. So notice with that radius and the ulna and their styloid processes, we have a concave surface here with the rounded edge of the scaphoid and the lunate, we have a convex surface. 
And that's what allows the biaxial motion of my wrist. What I commonly think of as my wrist, right? When I flex my wrist, that's really the joint between those four bones. It's not actually the carpals that form the wrist. It's two of the carpals and the radius and the ulna. But notice I can, again, I can flex and extend, but I also can move my hand side to side. So I've got biaxial motion at that joint here between the proximal phalanx and the uh, metacarpal. I have biaxial motion. So both of these, basically it's that same convex and concave, but it is elongated. And so when it is elongated, that elongation is going to allow for that biaxial motion. All right. Questions on that? All right, here's when things get really fun. I can take that same convex and concave shape, but I can kind of fold them in over the top of each other. And again, this is where my limited uh, drawing skills kind of fail us. So let's just look at the picture here. Notice again, we still have a convex surface. We still have a concave surface, but they're kind of folded over each other. And when they fold over each other in this way, they form a very special joint that is only found in one location. That one location is right here between the trapezium and the first metacarpal. And what makes this joint so special is that it allows us to oppose our thumb. What does it mean to oppose the thumb? They yeah. Slide it into his up. To move it across the surface of the palm. This is what truly has allowed us to become the masters of the universe, right? If we learn nothing over the past five years, six years, seven years, however you want to think of it, is as long as you can oppose your thumb, right? Which would allow you to tweet, for instance, you can literally rule the world, right? We get to be so proud. We have the big brains. Do we actually have the biggest brains on the planet? No. No. Blue whales' brains are way, way bigger than ours. Right? There are lots of animals that have brains that are bigger than ours. So then we hedged our bets. Okay, well, it's not absolute brain size. It's the relative brain size. How big is your brain in relation to your body? Yeah, a blue whale's brain is big, but its body is huge. So when you compare the size of his brain to the size of his body, relatively, it's tiny. Where do we fall in that? Relative brain size. Do we have the largest brains in relation to our body? Yes. Close. We come in silver. We're in second place. Anyone know who the gold medal winner is relative brain size to body size is? Dolphins. Dolphins, exactly. Dolphins actually have the largest brain in relation to their body, right? And if you think about it, three quarters of the planet is covered with water. They live in water. We don't. So why aren't dolphins ru ruling the planet? No opposable thumbs, right? Dolphins don't have opposable thumbs. They can't hold tools. They can't tweet. If you can't tweet, you can't be the president, right? That ability to oppose our thumb, hold tools, tweet is what has made us the masters of the universe, right? It's allowed us to do everything. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in middle school, right? When you got pulled over for drunk driving, one of the things that would happen is they would make you do a sobriety test. And one of the things you had to do on the sobriety test is you had to be able to go A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. So you would sit at the bar drinking, practicing that to make sure that you would get home, 
right? That ability to, and as you can see, I'm still pretty damn good with it. Even with all the vodka I've had for breakfast this morning, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. You do that, that shows that you can oppose your thumb, shows that you are coordinated enough that you can drive a car. That ability allows you to hold tools, allows you to tweet, allows you to do all those things, all because of that special joint of the thumb. All right, questions on that? Is there anything in your hand that would like stop you from being able to like oppose it that far? Like if you can't touch your thumb to your pinky? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure there are certain types of arthritis or something like that, inflammation or some type of inflammation of that joint, damage to that joint would affect your ability to oppose your thumb, sure. Right, same way people get tennis elbow, people do get, uh, you know, uh, uh, texting thumbs, you know, so that is a problem that people can have. So sure, yeah, I mean, the inflammation, things like that, damage could do it. The next one is kind of a peg and socket. If we look at this from the top, one bone is circular, and then the other bone surrounds it and basically has a socket that sits around the bone. And what that allows is that non-angular or that uh, non-axial rotation that we were talking about. This is what is known as a pivot joint. Now notice when they've drawn us the engineering examples of this, we see this really nicely. Here we have a bone that has a circle in the middle of it and a second bone that is nice and circular that sits into the top of it. But we don't actually really have bones like that in the body. However, here we see a classic example of how this works. Notice here we see that nice round head of the radius that we've talked about. And remember, we have that concave radial notch of the ulna. But the radial notch is just that, a notch. However, as you can see, there is a tendon that wraps around that head, stabilizing it, basically forming the ring of that. So in this case, we don't actually have to have bone that extends all the way around. We can actually use a ligament to stabilize the head in place and allow for that rotation. Notice this is going on at the proximal end of my forearm. So as we talked about, I have that ability to twist my hand so that the palm can face forward and the palm can face backward. And here at that proximal joint between the radius and the ulna, it is pivoting. Now that is not what's happening at the distal end. So we'll have to get back to that later. But here we have a pivot. The other classic pivot that if you remember we talked about involved the axis and the atlas. Remember our atlas was kind of a circular shaped bone and the axis has that dens that sticks up. Well, what happens is there is a tendon that wraps around the dens, holding it in place. And as we talked about, that is what allows that non-axial rotation of my head, allowing me to shake my head left and right. So again, the radius and ulna proximally only, the atlas rotating around the axis. Both of these are great examples of pivot joints. And there's just a few of them located in the body. And the same is true for our last one. Our last one, and again, very complicated name, probably hard to determine uh, what the shape of the bone features are with a ball and socket joint. What do you think the shape of the bone features are with a ball and socket joint? Ball and socket. There you go. One is a nice big round ball shape and the other is a nice concave socket shape. There you go, very, very technical. There are only two of these in the body. Well, I guess technically four because you have two on each side. And of course, what are the two ball and socket joints? 
Hip and shoulders. Yeah, hip and shoulder. We haven't talked about the hip yet, but we've definitely seen the one in the shoulder. Remember, we had that nice, big, round, ball-shaped head of the humerus that sits in that nice concave socket of the glenoid cavity of the scapula. And these allow the most range of motion. They're multi-axial. Not only can I move my arm up and down and forward and back, but all angles in between. But remember is also, as we talked about, I can rotate the humerus in there as well. So this allows multi-axial movements and rotations. Now, both the hip and shoulder are ball and sockets. Both allow multi-axial movements. Both allow rotations. However, are they equal in the movement that they allow? No. No. Your shoulder is by far the most dynamic joint in the body, allowing the most freedom of range of motion. But there is one downside to that. What is the downside to being basically the most open and most flexible and most dexterous moving joint of the body? It's the least stable. Yeah, it's the least stable. It's the one that's most likely to be dislocated. You have similar types of range of motion with the hip, but even Jean-Claude Van Damme can't move his leg around as much as he moves his arms. One of the reasons for that is inside the ball and socket of the hip is actually a ligament that helps to stabilize the head of the femur into the acetabulum of the os coxa, terms that'll make sense when our groups do their presentations today, which limits the range of motion. Why would you wanna limit the range of motion of the leg? Weight bearing, you're on it. Yeah, because it makes it more stable for being a weight bearing structure, exactly. The other thing that has allowed us to be the rulers of the universe is not that just that we have an opposable thumb, but we evolved to stand upright. Once we no longer had to use our hands to get around on the ground, it allowed them to evolve to be much more dexterous, allowing much more range of action, allowing us to hold tools, allowing us to tweet, right? And do all sorts of things like that. And so our bottom half became specialized for weight bearing, moving us through space, whereas our upper half allowed us to uh, evolve to manipulate the environment around us and become the rulers of the universe, all right? Woe to us if octopuses ever learn how to walk on just two legs. All right. Questions on that? All right. Excellent. You know, I did have a question. Uh, it was yeah. back at the uh, hinge. Uh, one of my friends had to like he dislocate his elbow. And was that just because he didn't have anything to stop it from, or like he was double jointed basically. Well, so, okay. Did he dislocate it or was he double jointed? No, he was double jointed so he could like, you know, hyperextend it on purpose. Okay. Well, uh, okay. So here's what I would say. All of us have an ability to hyperextend our elbow a little bit. Right. Uh, and again, uh, anybody here able to really hyperextend their elbow? Willing to admit it and show it to us on camera? Nope, all the shy people. I guarantee you that with 20 people in here, somebody has a, uh, a, a double jointed or a uh, able to hyperextend their elbow. They're just not willing to demonstrate it for us. Typically what that means when you're able to hyperextend something beyond what most people are able to, uh, it's one of two things, either uh, in most cases, it is a looseness or an elasticity to the ligaments that allow for more uh, displacement of those, or it can be a variation in the shape of these bones. Notice with that trochlear notch of the ulna, if it was more narrow, that would restrict your range of motion. If it was more open, it would allow more range of motion. 
So some of it is going to be the morphology of the bones, and some of it is going to be the looseness and the elasticity of the joints. Now, as you as you pointed out, and as we mentioned, like with the shoulder, the looser the joint is, the more likely that dislocation can occur. Mm -hmm. But just because you happen to be more able to hyperextend your elbow doesn't mean that you're necessarily more likely to dislocate it, but it could mean that. Yeah, it could be. It's going to depend on, like I said, the ligaments, and it's going to depend on the morphology of the bones. All right. Excellent. All right. With that, we are done with all of our uh, functional classifications, all of our structural classifications, all of our specific types. And again, one of the things that I have tried to emphasize is remember, you are not going to be responsible for the specific names of specific joints. But notice for all of the different types of joints we've talked about, we have identified the bones that form them. We have identified its structural type, its functional type, and the type of movement that it allows. So make sure you're able to do that for at least one or two of all of the specific types of synovial joints we have talked about, and really all of the joints. For all joints, you should be able to know where they're formed, what they're structural, what they're functional, what their specific type is, and the type of movement they allow. All righty. Questions on that? All right, excellent. This is a good point for our first break. Now that we know how joints function, we need to talk about the movements that those joints allow. And that is what we're going to do after the break. So let's go ahead and take our first break. Uh, we will take a 15 minute break. Uh, so it looks like it is 9.07 now. So let's come back at 9.22. And I will start the recording at that point. All right, any questions? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes.